strangers appear on the Empire's edges, pale-skinned men with glistening armor, watching, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. But today, the mighty Empire of Tawantin Suyu faces a battle within, unseen by the foreign eyes peering from afar. In the high mountains of the Andes, where the golden city of Cusco glows under a morning sun, a profound silence hangs. News spreads quickly. Huayna Capac, the beloved emperor, is dead. Rumors swirl, people whisper of an unseen sickness, a curse that arrived mysteriously from distant lands. With his passing, the future of this empire shifts dangerously. The sons of Huayna Capac, Atahualpa and Huascar now circle each other like hawks over prey. Each is determined to claim the throne, each willing to risk everything to sit as the supreme Sapa Inca. But why does Atahualpa, a warrior of the north, refuse to bow to the recognized heir? Why would Huascar allow this challenge rather than silence his brother once and for all? The people of Tawantinsuyu brace themselves, uncertain of which brother to trust, for they sense what looms just beyond their borders. Far away, Spanish conquistadors receive whispered promises of an empire overflowing with gold and silver, a place ripe for the taking. The ambitions of two brothers are about to collide with the might of these Spaniards. But how will this clash of wills end? Which force will the mighty Inca Empire face first? The rage of a brother or the steel of a stranger's? 1527, and the Inca Empire stands as the mightiest civilization in the Americas, known to its people as Tawantinsuyu, the land of the Four Quarters. This empire stretches across vast landscapes, from the coastal deserts of present-day Peru to the dense jungles and towering peaks of the Andes. Bound together by more than 20,000 miles of meticulously built roads, bridges and terraces, Tawantinsuyu is a testament to ingenuity and ambition, a kingdom woven into the very fabric of the land. In the heart of this empire sits Cusco, the navel of the world, a city of golden temples and towering stone walls so precisely constructed that even the blade of a knife cannot slip between the stones. From Cusco, the Inca emperors rule with absolute power, their authority extending to every corner of the empire. Farmers tend vast fields of maize and potatoes on carefully carved terraces, each one built to hold water and nourish crops in even the most rugged terrain. Herds of llamas and alpacas roam the hillsides, their wool spun into clothing fit for a king, and their strength relied upon to transport goods across the empire. At the helm of this vast domain is Huayna Capac, the son of the great emperor Tupac Inca Yupanqui, and a warrior and diplomat who has expanded the empire's borders further than any ruler before him. In his 34-year reign, from 1493 to 1527, Huayna Capac has fought back against rebellious tribes, reinforced his authority over distant provinces, and led campaigns that brought new lands under Inca rule. His conquests pushed the borders of Tawantinsuyu northward, reaching the lush regions of modern-day Ecuador. It is in these territories, so far from Cusco, where Huayna Capac begins to sense an invisible enemy, an illness with no known name, whispered to have come from across the sea. 1527, as Huayna Capac lies on his deathbed in the northern city of Tumabamba, the empire's future begins to tremble. Some say it is the will of the gods, others that it is a curse from the spirits of the conquered. Still, others speak of pale-skinned strangers seen along the coast, bringing with them the unfamiliar sickness that now spreads through the city like fire. Huayna Capac's once mighty frame is reduced to weakness, his breaths shallow as he clings to life. And as he fades, the unthinkable happens. His eldest son and heir, Ninan Kuyochi, succumbs to the same illness. The empire's line of succession is shattered, with their emperor gone, the Inca people look to his two remaining sons, Atahualpa and Huascar, each possessing a claim to the throne, each eager to prove himself as the next Sapa Inca. Born to different mothers and raised in different regions, the brothers embody two distinct visions of the empire. Huascar, the elder, has lived in Cusco and commands respect among the nobility and priests. He is the symbol of tradition, expected to inherit his father's throne as dictated by custom. 
Atahualpa, on the other hand, has spent his life on the frontiers in the north, where he has earned the loyalty of soldiers, generals, and hardened allies. He sees himself as a warrior and a ruler of action, a leader for an empire that demands strength more than ceremony. The brothers, however, are not equal in ambition. Atahualpa, sensing that his father's death grants him a unique opportunity, refuses to bow to Huascar. Instead, he rallies his forces in the Northern Territories, inspiring loyalty among those who have witnessed his prowess in battle and his ability to lead. Huascar, too, prepares for what he suspects will be a brutal struggle. He marshals his supporters, rallying the nobles of Cusco and the priests who see him as the rightful heir. The Empire now stands on the brink of an internal war, a struggle between two brothers that could rip Tawantinsuyu apart from within. For the people of the Empire, this is a time of ominous uncertainty. Tawantinsuyu, once a model of order and stability, now faces division at its core. The Inca Empire, so meticulously structured, is suddenly vulnerable, with its strength spread thin across mountainous terrains and distant provinces. As this rivalry brews, across the seas, Spanish ships are spotted on the horizon, carrying men with strange weapons, hungry for gold and power. It is a perfect storm, a leaderless empire torn by rivalry, weakened by the unseen curse of disease and about to face a foreign force unlike any it has ever known. What began as a power struggle between two brothers will soon become a fight for the very soul of the Inca Empire. Atahualpa strikes first, launching a brutal campaign to seize control of the empire. His forces, numbering in the thousands, march from the northern city of Quito with determination and rage. They move swiftly through the Andean highlands, facing bitter cold and treacherous terrain, but Atahualpa's warriors are relentless, hardened by years of battle. The regional factions throughout Tawantinsuyu begin to take sides, some out of loyalty, others out of fear. Huascar, despite his initial confidence, soon finds himself encircled. His own generals are torn. They question whether he has the strength to face his ruthless brother and some defect to Atahualpa's side, leaving Cusco's defenses vulnerable. The civil war spirals into a conflict like none the Empire has ever witnessed. Skirmishes erupt along the narrow mountain passes, villages are burned, and fields are laid to waste as each side struggles for dominance. Cusco's priests call upon the gods, performing ceremonies in desperation as soldiers pray for victory. Blood stains the once sacred earth, and the roads that once connected the empire now bear the marks of a deadly fracture. Battles are waged with fierce determination, each side refusing to yield. And as each conflict subsides, the stories of brutality spread, tales of villages left in ruin, of prisoners taken only to be slaughtered, and of generals who show no mercy. Early 1532, Atahualpa's forces close in on Cusco, driving Huascar's supporters into a final desperate stand. The armies meet on the battlefield outside of Cusco. Atahualpa's army, bolstered by his most loyal commanders and hardened soldiers from the north, overwhelms Huascar's forces. Huascar is captured. In an act that sends shockwaves through the empire, Atahualpa orders his brother imprisoned. The once powerful Sapa Inca of Cusco is dragged through the streets as a prisoner, a symbol of Atahualpa's dominance and Cusco's surrender. Yet, even in his triumph, Atahualpa's wrath is not satisfied. Knowing that Huascar's supporters might rally for revenge, he takes a final decisive step. Huascar is executed by Atahualpa's command. With this act, Atahualpa solidifies his control, but the cost is staggering. Tawantinsuyu, once a beacon of strength and unity, is left in shambles. Families are torn apart, villages lie abandoned, and countless warriors are lost. The empire stands, but it is no longer whole. Factions loyal to Huascar harbor resentment, and a sense of unease settles over the land. In the very moment of Atahualpa's victory, as he ascends to what he believes is uncontested rule, an unseen threat draws near. Far to the north, a small band of foreign soldiers, barely 168 men strong, makes its way toward the Andes. These men, led by a relentless and cunning Spaniard named Francisco Pizarro, 
have heard tales of an empire weakened by civil strife, a place rich beyond measure. They know of the gold and silver that lies in the heart of Tawantin Suyu. They arrive ready to take it. But Pizarro is no mere visitor. He is a predator, watching and waiting for the perfect moment to strike. They see in Atahualpa's recent triumph a fatal vulnerability. A ruler who has fought his own people, but is unprepared for the force that now stands before him. The Spaniards, few in number but driven by ambition, prepare for the moment when Tawantin Suyu's final test will arrive. The Inca Empire, once a bastion of strength, is now fractured, vulnerable, and poised for conquest. The day arrives, November the 16th, 1532. In the quiet town of Cajamarca, Francisco Pizarro and his small force of 168 Spaniards prepare for the encounter that will alter the fate of the Inca Empire. Atahualpa, confident and victorious after quashing his brother Huascar, is now the supreme ruler of Tawantin Suyu. The thought of danger does not cross his mind. He is secure in the loyalty of his tens of thousands of warriors camped around Cajamarca. To him, these foreign visitors are merely oddities, strangers to be entertained, perhaps even tamed, but nothing more. Pizarro, however, knows better. His men, though few in number, carry steel swords, muskets and cannons, weapons far deadlier than anything the Incas have ever encountered. And they have a plan. Pizarro sends a message to Atahualpa, inviting him to a meeting in the town square. His words are careful, respectful, designed to appeal to Atahualpa's sense of authority and curiosity. He tells the Sapa Inca that this meeting will be a gesture of goodwill, an opportunity for the Spanish and the Incas to establish a respectful relationship. Atahualpa agrees. Thousands of his soldiers remain outside the town, unarmed and unprepared for battle, as their ruler sees no reason for hostility. After all, who would dare challenge the might of the Inca? The Spanish are waiting, hidden around the square, their cannons loaded, their swords ready. They are outnumbered, but Pizarro has chosen his moment well. He has studied the Inca's confidence, their lack of suspicion, and he knows they are walking into a trap. Atahualpa reaches the square, a priest steps forward, carrying a Bible and a cross. Through an interpreter, the priest presents the Bible to Atahualpa, declaring that he must accept Christianity and acknowledge the Spanish king as his superior. Atahualpa, unaccustomed to such demands, is offended. He takes the Bible, turns it in his hands, unfamiliar with its contents or its significance, and, dismissing it, tosses it to the ground. The priest, incensed, calls out to Pizarro, declaring that Atahualpa has insulted the Christian faith. With this signal, Pizarro gives the order. The quiet square erupts into chaos as the Spanish spring their ambush. Cannons roar, their blasts echoing through the mountains, sending deadly iron shot into the gathered crowd. The Inca warriors, unarmed and unprepared, panic at the sight of the smoke and fire. Spanish muskets crackle, bullets tearing through the air, striking down those who try to resist. Atahualpa's attendants are cut down as they attempt to defend their emperor, who remains trapped in his litter, watching in horror as his once loyal subjects fall around him. The Spanish soldiers charge, their horses thundering across the square, a sight the Incas have never before witnessed. Mounted warriors, clad in metal and wielding steel weapons, descend upon them with a brutality unknown to Tawantin Suyu. The Inca soldiers, unable to comprehend this strange warfare, stumble and fall, their courage dissolving as the sounds of gunfire and the cries of their comrades fill the square. Many of them flee, others are trampled underfoot, while a few, loyal to the end, die trying to protect their Sapa Inca. Through the smoke and bloodshed, Pizarro himself lunges forward, seizing Atahualpa from his litter. In a single move, the Emperor of the Incas, the most powerful man in the Andes, is taken captive. His warriors, seeing their ruler restrained, lose what little will they had left to fight. The ambush ends as swiftly as it began, with the Spanish standing victorious in the wreckage of the square, surrounded by the bodies of fallen Incas. Atahualpa, now a prisoner, stares at his captors in disbelief, his kingdom's fate slipping from his grasp. 
Pizarro's men, wary of the vast Inca forces still camped around Cayamarca, watch him carefully, aware that their victory rests on a fragile illusion of power. Word spreads like wildfire through the Inca Empire. Messengers traverse the mountain passes, carrying the unbelievable news. Atahualpa, the emperor of Tawantinsuyu, is a prisoner of the Spaniards. The people of the empire are stunned. In Cusco, in Quito, and in the villages stretching to the edges of the empire, subjects can hardly fathom that their divine ruler has been bested, let alone captured. From his confinement, Atahualpa calculates his next move. He quickly recognizes the greed in Pizarro and his men's eyes, their fascination with the glint of gold and silver adorning his possessions. So he makes an extraordinary offer. In exchange for his freedom, Atahualpa promises to fill an entire room, 22 feet long and 17 feet wide, with gold up to a height of over 8 feet. It is an offer so vast that even the Spaniards are stunned. Visions of wealth and glory, beyond anything they had imagined, dance before their eyes. They accept the offer, confident that this mountain of treasure will seal their conquest. For months, messengers travel across the empire, gathering treasure from temples, nobles and subjects. Golden idols are melted down, sacred artifacts are dismantled, and the empire's wealth flows to Cayamarca, where it is stacked piece by piece, rising toward the promised mark. Atahualpa, meanwhile, remains confined, aware that his fate rests in the hands of his captors. Day after day, he watches as his empire's treasures disappear, sacrifices to the greed of these strange men. He clings to the hope that once the ransom is fulfilled, he will regain his freedom, that he might somehow salvage the empire from this devastation. July 1533, the ransom has been paid. Gold and silver worth millions by today's standards has been handed over to the Spaniards, and yet Pizarro's promises begin to unravel. Despite the unprecedented ransom, rumors swirl within the Spanish camp. Some claim Atahualpa is orchestrating an uprising. Others that loyal Inca armies are assembling to free their emperor. Pizarro, sensing his tenuous hold on the empire, decides that Atahualpa, even as a captive, is too dangerous to live. The Spaniards gather in secret, and the decision is made. Atahualpa will be executed. July 26, 1533, the Sapa Inca, Lord of the Andes, is led to the courtyard where his sentence will be carried out. Pizarro offers him a choice. He can die by burning if he remains true to his beliefs, or he can accept baptism and be executed by strangulation, a method Pizarro presents as more honorable. In the end, Atahualpa agrees to baptism, a final attempt to assert dignity even as his life slips from his grasp. The noose is drawn, and in the stillness of that moment, the last free emperor of Tawantinsuyu dies. Atahualpa's death is the final blow. Tawantinsuyu, already weakened by civil war and foreign invasion, is now leaderless, fractured and vulnerable. With their emperor gone, the Inca generals are paralyzed, unsure of whom to follow or how to respond to the Spanish presence. In Cusco, the remaining Inca nobility sense the danger looming over them, but without Atahualpa's leadership, they are left adrift. Some nobles consider rallying, others attempt diplomacy, but all face the reality that Cusco, once the center of the world, is now at the mercy of the conquistadors. Emboldened by their success and armed with gold and supplies from the ransom, Pizarro's forces begin their march to Cusco in August 1533. Despite the scattered attempts of resistance from Inca forces along the way, the Spanish advance is relentless. Those who dare to resist are cut down, and many others, fearing the wrath of these strange men who took down their Sapa Inca, simply step aside. The Spanish exploit the divisions left in the wake of Atahualpa's death, using fear and promises of power to win over local leaders and factions, turning them against one another. The empire, once a unified force, is now an empire divided, easily manipulated by the cunning strategies of the invaders. November 1533, the Spanish forces finally arrive at the gates of Cusco. The city, its golden temples and palaces gleaming under the Andean sun, stands as the last bastion of Inca strength and pride. But without a leader and with its military strength diminished by years of civil war and recent losses, 
Cusco cannot mount a significant defense. The Spaniards enter the city, seizing its temples, palaces, and riches. They ransack the heart of Tawantinsuyu, looting its treasures and desecrating its sacred spaces. The Inca nobles, powerless to resist, watch as their heritage is torn apart, piece by piece. By the end of 1533, Cusco, once the sacred and unassailable center of the Inca Empire, is under Spanish control. Tawantinsuyu, the land that spanned mountains, jungles and deserts, is now a possession of Spain. The Spaniards, having tasted the wealth and power of this empire, waste no time in establishing their rule, installing loyalists, imposing their religion and taking over the lands they have conquered. The death of Atahualpa, the fall of Cusco and the relentless march of the Spanish have brought the empire to its knees. The land of Tawantinsuyu, that had once belonged to the Sapa Inca, is now claimed by foreign kings. In the aftermath of Cusco's fall, the Spanish lay their plans for a new empire atop the ruins of the old. Francisco Pizarro, with dreams of cementing Spanish power along the Andean coast, selects a site along the Pacific. January 18, 1535, he founds the city of Lima, naming it Ciudad de los Reyes, City of the Kings. Here he envisions a seat of colonial authority, a coastal capital that will funnel the wealth of the Andes directly to Spain, securing the power of the Spanish crown in the New World. Lima, situated far from the Inca strongholds, provides Pizarro with control over the coast, marking the beginning of a new era, the Spanish colonial rule. As Spanish forces solidify their grip, the Inca Empire undergoes a transformation as devastating as it is irreversible. Where Tawantinsuyu once thrived with millions of subjects, a harsh reality settles over the land. Waves of European diseases, smallpox, measles and influenza spread through indigenous communities that lack any natural immunity. Disease, the silent conqueror, leaves a far greater impact on the Inca than any sword or cannon could. Yet the suffering does not end with illness. The Spanish impose the encomienda system, a forced labor regime that binds the surviving indigenous people to Spanish landholders. Indigenous laborers are sent to the mines, toiling under brutal conditions, extracting silver and other treasures that will fuel the Spanish economy, but destroy countless lives. Despite this conquest, Inca culture does not vanish. Though the Spanish attempt to impose their language, religion and customs, the spirit of Tawantinsuyu endures. Indigenous people adapt, merging their traditions with the Christian practices introduced by the Spanish. This syncretism, the blending of beliefs, gives rise to unique forms of worship, festivals and art that blend Inca spirituality with Catholic iconography. In hidden mountain villages, rituals to honor Pachamama, the Earth Mother, persist. Even as Spanish churches rise, the Inca continue to pay homage to their gods, weaving their ancient beliefs into the fabric of a new world. Rebellion, too, stirs beneath the surface. Over the decades, small uprisings flare up, led by those who refuse to surrender their heritage and autonomy. In remote regions like Vilcabamba, the last holdouts of Inca resistance endure, led by Tupac Amaru until his capture in 1572. His execution marks a symbolic end to organized Inca resistance, but whispers of revolt continue, passed down through generations. Centuries later, the memory of Tupac Amaru I will inspire Tupac Amaru II, whose rebellion against Spanish rule in the late 18th century will reignite the spirit of resistance in the Andes. The legacy of the Inca Empire, although shattered, lives on in the land itself. The Andean mountains bear the marks of Inca engineering, with terraces carved into the hillsides and stone temples standing as silent witnesses to a once mighty civilization. The Quechua language, spoken by millions, preserves the Inca worldview and offers a connection to ancestors who walked these lands long before. In the art, music and traditions of the Andes, the memory of Tawantinsuyu survives, a testament to resilience in the face of conquest. The Spanish era in Peru has begun, an era defined by colonization, exploitation and the relentless extraction of resources. Yet beneath the surface of this imposed new order, the enduring spirit of the Incas lingers, 
woven into the mountains, the rivers, and the very fabric of life in the Andes. The Inca Empire, though forever changed, remains an echo through time, a civilization that dared to unite an empire across mountains and deserts, that built wonders and wove its people together in a shared vision. Now, though subdued by the Spanish, its legacy persists, a reminder of the strength and resilience of a people who shaped a corner of the world and left their mark upon it. Bottom of form, 